Was ist Desinformation? Darüber diskutierten Wissenschaftlerinnen, Journalistinnen und Politaktivistinnen aus Mittelosteuropa in Tutzing. Sure. Uh, my name is Juana popescu Zanfid. I'm uh, currently director of the Global Focus Center in Bucharest, uh, which is an independent foreign policy and security think tank. Um, and currently I'm also a fellow with the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. I, um, I mostly do research in the field of um, resilience, uh, democratic resilience, um, resilience to disinformation and malign influence. And previously, I was um, uh, State Secretary for European Affairs. I, um, I advised the um, President of the Romanian Parliament, who is currently the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, <laughs> Mircea Joana. Um, and uh, at the beginning of my career, I was a journalist. <laughs> Um, I think the most salient feature of disinformation in Romania is that it's mostly homemade. Um, it is not the product of any external actor. That is not to say that external actors, such as Russia uh, more specifically, are not trying to take advantage of the context that we create for them. Uh, but we create it. Um, and it and it started, uh, it, it's not even a recent phenomenon. I think it uh, started very much with political manipulation and with the interests of um, both politicians and groups of interest to create a misleading narrative um, around their goals and uh, and objectives way before 2010 even so before we had trolls and bots and so on uh, political parties in Romania uh, competing in elections campaigns uh, were hiring uh, mostly students they were paying them peanuts uh, to essentially spend uh, their days posting on the forums of the most important newspapers uh, in favor of their own party and uh, against their opponents as uh, anonymous um, or, you know, people with uh, multiple identities. Um, so we invented trolling, uh, I think, way before the Russians made it into uh, such, a, such an industry. We have this historic tensions with Russia whereby we regard them as the enemy. So anything carrying a Russian label is something that we reject um, out of hand. However, precisely because we feed ourselves this illusion of invulnerability and we think, um, you know, no Russian disinformation can ever reach us, um, that is why we are particularly vulnerable to um, indirect Russian influence or the Russian influence that doesn't carry a clear Russian label. Um, and that is how now uh, we have ended up with uh, a radical party, a far-right party in parliament for the first time after 2008. Uh, and that was very much because most mainstream politicians uh, and um, even civil society influencers and pundits and so on uh, thought Romania would just not experience this anytime soon. We were telling ourselves we are so not like Hungary or Poland or other neighboring countries, so this would not happen to us. Um, and, and so in the recent election campaign, um, pretty much everybody uh, contented themselves with campaigning online or on TV. Uh, it was also the coronavirus context, so it was easier to do so from a distance um, and it was only the the, the radicals the, the the far right party uh, that actually did face to face campaigning touring the country um, very much making use of people's fears and uh, dissatisfaction and i think that is you know um, what i would say the um, the other important set of features that we have I think our resilience as a society to influence and disinformation is low uh, because we have very low trust in institutions. Um, people are very disillusioned with politics and with the actual capacity of democratic governance to deliver. And so they attribute that to democracy as a whole. Uh, they see the democratic process as a very 
complex, complicated one that's just used by politicians to get rich and influential, and it's not really delivering anything for themselves. We have um, um, one of the lowest levels of uh, intra-societal trust, so that essentially means it, that we not only distrust politicians, but we distrust each other. Um, and so we um, have very politicized and weak media. Essentially, this is, a, this is a very explosive mix of circumstances where we are just waiting for whoever wants to come and use um, those fears that we have and, and those grievances that we have against us. So I think this is what, what the general landscape is in this respect. Yeah, um, I think some of the main narratives are that we need to um, take our country back. Uh, the, the narrative that says that Romania is only taking orders from Washington and Brussels and uh, our politicians are, uh, are there just to serve the interests of foreign agents. Uh, and that so we need to um, regain the sovereignty, uh, essentially. Uh, this is this is a consequence of the fa of of the um, EU integration process, basically, where we actually embraced that, and and we were very happy to be given recipes from Brussels and Washington as to what to do. Then, when we became EU members, we uh, we were complaining about the lack of such recipes. Um, but obviously, at some point, having. Uh, having gained the confidence that we are now mature, we stand on our feet and, and so on, um, now we don't like that anymore and we, we resent even the fact that we, uh, we have done that before. All of the things that are essentially meant to weaken our relations with European and, and Euro-Atlantic allies. Uh, the other one is the narrative around um, values, traditional values. They're under threat um, from the EU. Um, the, the EU uh, comes and um, imposes a, a kind of world that we would not want to raise our children in, one where um, LGBTQ uh, people have equal rights, where um, obviously this is phrased as, uh, um, you know, uh, gay people are going to be able to marry and uh, uh, we're going to have this tremendous demographic decline um, and they're going to um, it, even steal uh, our children uh, in some shape or form. So it, it, it ranges from they're going to be able to adopt children and they're going to raise them in an, in an immoral way to they're going to steal children altogether. Um, that the, the West wants to destroy our religion because the Orthodox religion is uh, an, um, in, in a minority in the EU uh, and, and it's kind of a, uh, our uh, bulwark against uh, a foreign interference. So that's why they want uh, to uh, essentially do away with everything uh, surrounding Orthodox religion. Um, I think there are also probably narratives about more narrow issues like uh, migration, um, despite the fact that we n have never had any major influx of migrants, not even with the migrant crisis. We don't have an, a problem and we have a huge labor shortage, so we could use some. Um, there are still uh, narratives about the import of foreigners uh, precisely in order to alter the the traditional makeup of the Romanian people. Um, so, yeah, I think these are the main ones. I think we really need to keep in mind that the, um, the government, whichever that is, whether the current government or uh, any other, uh, any other governments that will come, uh, the political class um, and elites as a whole, um, don't really have an interest in addressing this problem because they stand to benefit from it and they and they stand to use it uh, to their advantage. 
So I think this creates a very big problem because when we say what should be done in Romania or in any given country to address this, um, I think we should personalize this more. You know, who should do it? Because if the question is what should be done in the sense of what can we as civil society do? Well, that's limited because civil society is a very important element of the democratic uh, system and, uh, and, and practice, uh, but it's not the main one. So um, at, at this point, I am convinced that the main actors who could actually do something about it don't really want to do anything um, about the core problems and they're happy to divert attention to external actors and, and always speak about Russia as if it was the only producer of disinformation uh, because that's easier because there uh, there is consensus so um, you know they're they're happy to to have to deal with that rather than with their internal um, issues so that is one thing and that is that in the way of um, fighting disinformation and malign influence we have an important adversary, and that is our own government and our own political elites. The second thing is that disinformation is really something that involves simple tools. It's not very sophisticated, um, but if you look at just the coronavirus disinformation uh, around masks and vaccination and so on, that was just messaging just messaging put out in a very simple fashion on social media and on mainstream media and um you know spoken by politicians and so on and so forth um and and it's been tremendously successful so if you were the one doing it would you abandon a recipe that is so low cost and so successful so I think we're going to see just more of that there's the level of sophistication is not necessarily going to increase and so, unfortunately, we keep discussing um, all sort of um, uh, ways that we could address it and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's always the same thing. It's, we have the same conversations as we did three, four, five years ago. The threat really hasn't evolved, so there is no reason why we would just keep discussing it and while nothing really happens um, because the the challenges behind it that these structural vulnerabilities that I mentioned are really tough to address so I think we are very happy to mention them to define the threat one of its components is let's say uh, fact checking or media literacy and and we choose to very quickly focus only on that because that's the easiest thing that's the one thing that we can do uh have some media literacy classes uh do some fact checking you know you'll find the money at some point and uh, and then you can do it impact analysis shows this is really making only a minor effect on the whole thing um however we still we're lazy and we still work on the same thing um, and again going back to my previous point there is a simple explanation for that as well if we again as civil society are up against uh, a lack of tr real willingness to engage from the other state actors well that's pretty much the only thing we can do but it's by far not the most important We, we would like to have quick answers uh, and quick fixes um, for these things. But in most cases, there are no, fixed, uh, no quick fixes. This is a problem that's been generated over decades. Uh, and so it, it's hard to imagine it will be solved soon. Um, I think, you know, clearly um, we, we absolutely need to improve the media environment. We don't really have a plurality of views in our public uh, space. We have a multiplicity of sources, but the narratives are very much the same, especially when uh, the landscape in Romania, the media landscape is divided among a few, let's say, oligarchs um, who own various media outlets. So essentially, even if you have 50, 
In fact, you just have the same three voices who communicate through multiple channels. Um, so ideally, and I say ideally because I don't know uh, and how to how to do it, and I because I don't see any trace that, that there is any attempt to improve the situation. Um, ideally, you would really create a kind of democratic space where you have healthy information and a healthy information environment. Um, I think there is going to be pressure on politicians um, to continue to radicalize their discourse. And I think to the extent that we have the instruments, whether legal or just civil society acting as a watchdog and so on, we should denounce that um, as as being extremely wrong because that that elevates disinformation to a, a legitimate level. It gives it legitimacy if you hear it from authorities in the in the state. Um, I think in Romania we clearly need to improve media literacy. It's not an answer for everything. I think it's wrong to assume that if you if you have media literacy courses that solves your problem, it very often doesn't necessarily solve your problem. Um, but we have zero uh, media literacy at this point. We have very scattered attempts by civil society, but there is n there is no effort of scale. Um, so I think there should be a lot more emphasis on that in the education system. Um, there should be uh, clearly an an emphasis on. Um, not necessarily regulating, but at this point, at least monitoring the the uh, social media space. And the best we can do at this point is to at least bring to the fore um, when where we identify websites that are illegitimate um, and what's called inauthentic um, online behavior. Uh, that should that should be out there and. Um, again, to the extent that it's legal and doesn't amount to censorship, um, then try to limit their ability to uh, influence the the public. Um, there are a lot of other things, but I'm 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 afraid they're utopian because uh, you you know I'm tempted to say with such low trust in institutions, we're we're always going to have a problem. So we need to consolidate trust in institutions. People will trust institutions if they have poor governance. So we need to invest in in, in good governance. Um, we also, um, you know, have to invest in understanding why society is so polarized and to try to uh, reach across our bubble. And that goes for politicians as well as for civil society. Even for us experts, I mean, I think we tend to talk to one another. We feel comfortable in the company of one another. Everything we discuss tends to stay here. Um, we, there is really not a lot of a, there, there is not a bridge between our knowledge and social activism where somebody, very likely NGOs, and, and there are very few in Romania doing that, would actually go there to the grassroots and talk to the people and, and try to educate them, listen to them, understand them, and so on and so forth. It's usually two separate worlds. So unless we bridge these worlds, it's going to be very difficult to change anything.